Welcome back, my friends, to Wilderness Wanderings, Making Lasting Footprints in the Sand. Can you believe that we're already to week seven? I just want to encourage you that if you have found yourself a little bit behind, I would encourage you to just um, pick it up where you left off because I'm absolutely sure that God has a word for you and that he doesn't want you to not finish this Bible study. So... This week, we talked about um, that you might know him, part two, and we actually looked at uh, Jesus, that he's the healer of our heart, that he's our loyal friend, and he's the worker of miracles, and he's an unmatched comforter, and he's our devoted intercessor. And I just trust that this lesson this week really inspired you and really encouraged you, and as you... And if you're working on it right now and you're not finished with it, I just have a feeling that you're going to be so blessed and so encouraged through, through the work this week. Well, I have to tell you something that my absolutely favorite topic I get to talk about today. And you know what that is? That is our Savior, Jesus. I can't think of anything better, anything more exciting that I'd rather talk about than Jesus Christ. Because this week we looked about how the wilderness time is a time when we, when we get to know him, when we come to know him in, in, in a powerful and awesome way. And in week seven, we talked about how, you know, we looked at Jesus and we looked at, at in those wilderness times that we really get to know Jesus. Well, let me just tell you that when Jesus was walking here on this earth in the first century, uh, as you know, he chose 12 disciples to be with him. But I want to tell you that out of those 12, he had what I call his inner circle of disciples. And that was he had chosen three disciples to experience just a little bit more of what the other nine did. And that, would, that was Peter, James, and John. And they were allowed to walk with him and go with him into places that, that the other nine were not allowed. So can you imagine how it impacted their ministry and how it impacted their life as they, as they continued on with Jesus and then as they continued into the early church as, as leaders of the church as well? And I wanna remind you though, that when the disciples were walking with Jesus during that time, when they were walking with him, um, that they were still living underneath the Old Testament, underneath the law, because Jesus had not yet died. So Jesus chose those three to be his inner disciples. But I want to tell you that the moment that Jesus Christ died on the cross, that veil was ripped in the temple from top to bottom, which gave you and I access into the inner courts, into the, the, the very presence of God, and into that inner circle. You and I have been invited to come into that inner circle. And so I want to really encourage you to ask Jesus to bring you closer, to just, as, as, you know, as we're going to talk about what that means today, about being in that inner circle, and, and maybe try and experience a little bit about what Peter and James and John experienced as they were walking that close with Jesus. And we're going to look at some of the different things that they experienced. But I want to encourage you to just press in, just press in just a little bit closer, just press in a little bit closer. You know, often when Jesus was walking down the streets, um, you know, the, the, the crowds, they followed him. I mean, they, you know, as he went on in ministry and the more popular he became, the crowds would just come and just close in really, um, really really close in and sometimes he couldn't even hardly move and people had to push their way through just to even get close to him like that woman did who was who had been sick for all those years and she just felt like if she just could reach out and touch his his cloak she could be healed but but there was so many people she had to push and shove her way through all those people that day well you and I we can push and shove our way through those people too. And we can get as close as we want to with Jesus Christ. And so as we press in a little bit closer, how can we do that? Let's look at three different things at how we can do that. 
And the first thing is this, is that you and I, we need to observe his miracles. Now, I talked about that a little bit last week, but let's look at that a little bit deeper this week. We need to observe his miracles. Now, on three different occasions, Peter, James, and John were invited with Jesus to experience um, different things. And so right now, I want to talk to you about two of those, two of those miracles that they experienced as they were invited to come into his inner circle. And on this particular day that Jesus was walking from town to town and he was just, you know, teaching along the way and walking along the way. And there were many people that were following him. And then all of a sudden he encounters a very, um, I want to say a very distraught man. And his name was Jairus. And you find this story in Mark chapter 5. His name was Jairus and he had he had left his home that morning or or the day before I think. And, and he, had, he had gone to find Jesus because you see Jairus was a ruler in the synagogue. But he was very, very upset and very distraught and very anxious and worried because you see his daughter was was lingering on the edge of death his 12 year old daughter and so he came and he said oh Jesus will you please come with me to my home because my daughter is sick and she's gonna die and and Jesus said he put his hand on him and he said just believe just believe and so he Jesus began to go with him along with all the other people and all the disciples that were with them that day he began to go with them and when they were on the way some of Jairus's household servants came to him and he said listen don't bother the teacher anymore because your daughter has already died oh can you imagine how heavy his heart was and how it must have sank to the very bottom of his of his feet and Jesus said listen don't worry about it. And they continued to go on. And, and then it says that he took Peter, James, and John into the house when they got to Jairus' place. He took them into the house. And inside the house was all were all these people. You know, they had, in those days, they had hired professional mourners and criers and all of those people to, you know, to come alongside the family. And they were already mourning and crying because his daughter had already died. And Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Now the other nine were not allowed to go in. And so he, and he made all those people leave the house. And he said, listen, why are you crying? She's only asleep. And you know what the people did? They laughed at him. They mocked at him because they had seen her. They, had, they, known, they knew that she had, had already died and they laughed at him. I don't know about you. But I learned a long time ago not to ever laugh at Jesus when he gives me a word because I know that he's able to do things much greater than I can even imagine and his ways and his plans are so much greater than my ways and my plans. And so Jesus and those three inner disciples, they walked into the house and they encountered a very distraught mom and dad as they leaned over the bed of their dead daughter. And Jesus felt compassion and he felt, um, he felt just pity for this family. And he leaned over and he put his hand on her and he said, daughter, arise, arise. And at that moment, their 12 year old daughter rose from the dead. She rose from the dead. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine? So my friends, Peter, James, and John, they experienced the full power of Jesus Christ at that moment because I don't know about you, but there's no other power, there's no other power in, that I can even think about than raising somebody from the dead. That's the greatest power ever. And those three disciples were with Jesus. So let's think about what they might have encountered that the other nine did not encounter. So let's say this. That, um, that, that's not what I want. Right here it is. Um, inside the house, that's where victory flourished. But outside of the house, defeat was evident. Defeat was evident. Inside the hope is where hope blossomed. And outside the house was hopelessness abounded. Inside the house was joy, immeasurable joy. And outside the house was anguish and loud wailing. And inside the house, there was peace and comfort. And outside the house, there was only commotion. 
So do you understand that Peter, James, and John, they experienced what the other nine did not because they were chosen to be the inner disciples. Because they were chosen, even if the other nine had been on the outside just peeking in or putting their ear up to the glass, they could have only seen maybe fig, figments of the people's um, forms or, or just barely heard whispers. They didn't experience it, but Peter, James, and John did. That's why you and I, we need to press in just a little bit closer. Now, there's another miracle that only Peter and John experienced, Peter, James, and John experienced, and that was when they were invited with Jesus to go up on a high mountain, and it was when they were up on that high mountain, and this is found in Matthew chapter 17. It's in a couple of the other Gospels as well. Matthew chapter 17 gives a beautiful description of when Jesus Christ was transfigured before them. So in other words, he, he takes Peter, James, and John up on this high mountain, and right in their presence, he transfigures from his earthly, from his earthly um, clothes into his heavenly garments. They saw Jesus. They saw him in his divinity and in his power and, and all that he exemplified, all his glory. They saw it. And it was so, so amazing to them. It says that Jesus' clothes became whiter than they could even, than anybody could even bleach them. And his, his whole person became um, even as bright as the sun. So they couldn't even hardly look on him. It says that they fell on the ground and they were amazed. And Jesus picked them back up. And even Peter, he didn't know what to say. He was so amazed and so in awe of what was happening before him. It says that he said, oh, Lord, it's good that we're here. And, and along with Jesus came Moses and Elijah. Now they saw two people from the Old Testament that they had known about. They knew their stories. They read it. They had studied it as they were growing up. Oh, my goodness. Can you imagine what they experienced on the Mount of Transfiguration? It totally changed their life. It totally changed their life. So think about what Peter, James, and John experienced. They heard God speaking from heaven because at that moment, a, a, a cloud came and enveloped them. And they heard God say, listen, this is my son whom I love and whom I am well pleased with. I want you to listen to him. They heard God speaking. This is the second time that, that God's voice was heard. The first time was when Jesus was baptized. And now Peter, James, and John heard it for the very for the second time possibly. Or if they hadn't been at the baptism, maybe it was the very first time. We don't know. But they heard God speaking. They heard God speaking. They saw Jesus like they had never experienced before. They saw him in his heavenly garments. And I, I'm, I'm guessing that if they had had any doubts, any doubts whatsoever of his divinity, they were gone, vanished at that very moment. There's no way in the world that they could ever deny that Jesus Christ was truly the Messiah. God's son that had come down from heaven. I'm assuming that it catapulted their faith. It catapulted to their faith to new levels. It gave them an awareness of their humanity in light of Christ's divinity. Oh, yes, it did. And don't we all need that? We all need to see our humanity in light of Christ's divinity. Yes, we do. It, it, um, it helped them. I, I'm imagining that the, that, that experience on the, on the Mount of Transfiguration so helped them as they became leaders in the early church. So you see, my friends, it is so important and, and vital that you and I accept that invitation to go into the, into the Holy of Holies, to enter into that inner circle that Jesus has invited us into. But you and I, we need to press in a little bit further so that we can experience even more. We need to press in. So the first thing that and how we can press in is to observe his miracles. 
The second thing is this, is that you and I, we need to listen to his teaching. We need to so listen to his teaching. You know, in, in that day when Jesus was traveling from city to city, you know, the people, they would, they would congregate, thousands of them would congregate and somehow they heard Jesus speaking without a microphone. Can you believe it? I have my little microphone here because if I didn't have my microphone, you wouldn't hear it as clearly. Or when you and I get up in front of a, a large crowd to speak, we are always given a microphone so people can hear us. Jesus didn't need one. But I want to tell you that they listened to him. Sometimes it was on a hillside. Other times it was in the temple courts. Other times it was in a boat or it was at a dinner table or it was in a crowded room. Remember when they, when they brought that lame man and they put him right down through the roof because Jesus was in a crowded room and they couldn't even get through. Or maybe it was like Mary and it was at his feet. But you and I, we need to sit at his feet too and we need to listen we need to listen those people they listen for hours on end sometimes days and you and i need to take what he says and 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 really listen to what he says so today i'd like to just go over three different things probably some of the most common phrases that jesus spoke and how we can really listen to them and the first one is found in in Luke chapter 9, it's in a couple of the other Gospels as well, but it says this, Luke 9, begin, or verse 23, it says, Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Jesus is talking about those that he would consider true disciples. True disciples, disciples that, that would be willing to give up everything for him. That's what a true disciple is. So if you and I listen to that. There's two points to that verse. And, and, and we know that verse. Obviously, we know that verse. But there's two points, two th important things in that verse that we need to look at. The first one is this. It says that if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross. And take up his cross. Now in that days, um, a cross was a symbol of death. It was a symbol of death. So what is Jesus saying? That if we are to really truly follow him, then we need to die to ourselves. We need to die to ourselves. So in other words, it's not what I want. It's not what's important to me. It's not what my agenda is. It's not what my schedule is. And, and for those of us that live by lists, you know, you know what that's like. You know, we get up in the morning and we write out our list of all the things that we want to do today. All those important things that we want to do today. Well, let me tell you that making a list is not wrong. It's not wrong, but if Jesus decides to interrupt that list, and we decide to not do what he's calling us to do, then, then, then that's not, that's not what he wants from us. He wants us to be willing to be flexible in our day, willing to be flexible in our day. And it's not how I feel. You know, today on the day, in the daily life, that we live in or in the 21st century we live in a very me society everything is about me everything is about my wants you know what the world teaches us the world teaches us that that um, if you don't like it then get out if you don't like your marriage if you're upset with your husband then get out you don't need that if you don't like where you're at if you don't like your job if you don't like your church or whatever if you you know whatever you don't like get out of it Get out of it. Now, I'm not saying that we, you know, that, that that's wrong in, in a lot of ways, but, but I think that it's too easy sometimes. And Jesus just says, listen, I want you to die to yourself. I want you to die to yourself. Let me tell you what my plans are, my agenda is, my schedule is, my will for your life. And I want you to go with me because remember, and I already quoted this already, that his ways and his plans are so much greater than ours could ever be, could ever be. So that's the first thing to that verse. The second thing to that verse is that we are to take up our cross daily, 
daily. Did you hear that? We are to take up our cross daily. So not when we retire, not when it's convenient. Don't we often say that? Oh, well, I'll do that when it's convenient. Or not just on Sundays or when our Bible study group meets or, or when our small group meets or when the pastor comes over or on those ministry days when I have to be on target and I have to be, I have to be right there and I have to you know, show everyone that I'm this incredible Christian. No, not at all. Or as some believers, Christmas and Easter. No, not at all. He says, listen, I want you to take up your cross and I want you to follow me. I want you to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me every single day. Every single day. So you and I, we need to listen to what Jesus is telling us. The second one is this, is found in... In Matthew, and you know this verse, Matthew, these verses, Matthew 28 through 30, it says, Matthew 11, 28 through 30, it says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So he says, listen, come to me. Just come to me. Come to me. So in other words, um, if, you know, when our hearts are burdened, when we're confused and when we're troubled, when we're afraid, when we're afraid, do we go to him? Do we literally always go to him when we're worried? You know, I didn't know my grandfather, but um, I heard that his first wife and his first child died when his wife was giving birth. Both of them died. So you can only imagine that when he married my grandma, First of all, my grandma had to talk him into getting pregnant and having a child because he was fearful. And when she finally did get pregnant and he agreed to it, and in those days, of course, the, the, the husbands didn't go in the room. It, I, I was told that when she was in labor, that he was literally pacing back and forth, back and forth. And I think I even heard that he pounded his fist in the wall and made a big hole because he was so afraid. But isn't that what we do? We pace back and forth when we're worried about things. We're, we're, we're anxious. We're concerned about things. And so we pace back and forth. And instead of going to God, we, you know, we just, we fret about it. We get anxious about it. We go to bed with our hearts full of, of all this anguish and all this concern and worry. And I know that life isn't good sometimes. And I know that we have people in our lives and loved ones in our lives that we should worry about them. But Jesus says, listen, bring it to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I know that you, you know that my husband built me this incredible prayer room in my house, and I always tell him that he's the envy of all my friends, and that prayer room is the envy of all my friends as well. But he, he built this incredible cross that goes from the floor all the way up to the ceiling. And at the bottom of the cross, I put a, um, a velour, like a, a, um, like a, just a, just a velour thing in bajabber um, at the bottom. And on one side, I, I have two boxes at the bottom of the cross. And one box is what I call my treasure chest. So when I, when I'm upstairs and I'm, I'm in my time of prayer, when I'm reading the word of God, I will come across a treasure that I think is a treasure. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is so speaking to me. I'll write it down on a piece of paper and I'll fold it up and I'll put it in my treasure chest. And then sometimes when I'm in there, I'll just go through and I'll just take out those treasures and remind myself of what God said to me and, and the, the incredible privileges and treasures that he's offered us in the word of God. On the other side is another basket that I put all my prayer requests. I put all my prayer requests in that box and, and when, I'm, when I'm heavy and, and my heart is heavy and I'm burdened about something or a, a loved one and stuff, I'll write it down or when I'm reading a passage of scripture and I'm like, oh my goodness, this is what Betsy needs or this is what Matt needs or this is what Lou needs, I'll write it out as a prayer like I've shown you before already and I'll put it on a piece of paper and I'll put it in that box. 
And you know what I'm doing? I'm leaving it at the foot of the cross. I'm leaving it at Jesus' feet. And I can walk away because I know it's there. I know it will always be there. And I will periodically go through those and I'll pray those again over and over again, those things that God puts on my heart at that minute. So I want to tell you, come to Jesus. Find a quiet place. Even if it's in the chair in your house, find a quiet place. And come before him and, and picture yourself stepping over the throne into his presence. Picture yourself doing that. And, um, and picture yourself sitting on his lap when your heart is burdened. So come to him. That's the second one. And then the third one is this. And we, found, we find this in Matthew 6, 33. And it says this, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. We know that verse, but do we live by it? Do we live by it? There's two things in this verse. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So in other words, seek first his work and his character. His work and his character. Definitely seek first his work and his character. I remember my, uh, a friend of mine told me that her pastor will um, often take just, a, like, you know, you and I might have the red letter edition of the Bible, and I love it because all Jesus' words are written in red, and he said that sometimes for a whole week he'll take one phrase, one phrase of Jesus, and he'll ponder it. He'll ponder it for a whole week. So I want to encourage you to do that. You know, just find out where um, in, in the Experiencing God Bible study, this is what it, one of the points it says, um, find out where God is at work and join him in his work. Find out where God is at work and join him in his work. So I want to encourage you, you know, seek first, put his work above your work. Put his will, his plans above all that you want for yourself because, and, and then put his character, make sure that you emulate him. Make sure you emulate him. And that is the next point and the last point that I want to talk to you about today. And so the first one is to observe his miracles. The second one is to listen to his teaching. And the, and the third one is this. Watch his actions. You and I, we can't emulate him. We can't, we can't show Christ in our life if we don't press in a little bit closer and watch the way that he lived. Watch the way he lived. So you might want to ask yourself two questions when you watch his actions. First, what was important to him? And second, how did he treat people? How did he treat others? And so what was important to him? Well, there's two things in particular that were really, really important to Jesus that we see over and over and over again in the Gospels. And that is this, is that his father was really important to him and people were really important to him. And you, you know that his father was important to him when he took the time away to be away, um, to, take, to go to a solitary place many times, sometimes for the whole night, to be with his father, to be with God. On the last night, just before he was arrested, just before he was taken by the authorities to be crucified, to be tried and then crucified later on that night, that night, where was he? He took his inner circle of men, Peter, James, and John. And this is the third instance that we see where they're taken a little bit further than the nine, than the other nine. And he takes them further in the garden. And what does he do? He goes off by himself and he begins to pray. And Peter, James, and John are not too far away. They can hear what he's saying. And even though they fell asleep, I know that they understood the importance of of his relationship with his father. They saw an intimacy. You and I, we cannot experience that intimacy unless we press closer, unless we listen, unless we, 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 we go with him in, in, and we, we follow him to those places, to those places. And so his father was so important to him. And then the second thing is, is that he invested in the lives of people. 
He invested his lives in the, in the lives of people and even sinners and especially sinners. Remember when they used to laugh at him and mock him and, and ask him questions and they used, to, they used to question why in the world are you having dinner with a sinner when the sinner is, is an outcast in the community? And Jesus said, oh, but it's the sinners that really need me. It's the sinners that really need me. So those are the kinds of people that Jesus invested in. And so then the second question is this. So the first one is this. What was important to him? His father, a relationship with his father was important to him. And second, people. He invested his lives in people. And the second thing is, is how did he treat others well? He taught them with unconditional love. No matter who they were, he always took time for people. No matter who they were, imagine... Imagine on that day when Jesus was in the temple courts and the religious leaders found a woman that was caught in adultery and dragged her through the streets to test Jesus. And they used her as bait. And we don't know if she even had any clothes on. Maybe she grabbed the sheet from around the bed, from the bed or whatever, and, and put it around her before they dragged her out. But they dragged her before the, before the authorities, and they threw her in front of Jesus. And Jesus was teaching in the midst of all of these people that day. And, and, and they said, listen, Jesus, she was caught in the act of adultery. Now, the law says that we should stone her, but we want to know what you have to say. They would just want to test him. And this poor woman, this poor woman was humil... Humi um, whatever that word is. She was mortified. I'll use that word. Mortified. She was humil... Mil whatever. I can't even say it because I'm so excited. But anyways, she was so mortified. But, but look at what Jesus did. He bent down on the ground and he wrote something in the sand. And then he said, listen, if you are without sin, then you cast the first stone. And what did all the people do? They all left. They all walked away. Because they knew in their hearts that they could not cast the stone at her. They knew that. And so then Jesus lifts up and he looks her right in the eye and he says listen where are all these people did not anyone condemn you she said no one sir and he said neither do i condemn you that's in john chapter 8 neither do i condemn you he said oh my goodness imagine how she felt at that moment he didn't judge people his speech was lined with, with love, and it was seasoned with grace, and, and, and that's a huge one. He always talked with, with, with the, the most up, utmost respect for people, and he loved people, and he, he inspired people, and he encouraged them, and he always spoke words that were uplifting unless he had to, you know, confront them in their sin, unless he had to confront them. But he didn't judge people, and he loved people. And you and I, we need to emulate his actions. And the only way we can do that is to press in a little bit closer, is to press in a little bit closer and to watch his actions, watch his actions. So you and I, my friends, we can do that. We can, as we press in, there's three ways to do that. Observe his miracles, listen to his teaching, and watch his actions. So, my friends, Let's do that. Let's join him in that inner circle. Let's answer the invitation to walk closer with him. Until next time, my friends, have a wonderful and blessed week.